Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, who have joined us uh, on this Dr. Fundi channel uh, via multiple social media uh, platforms, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and also via Instagram. Um, welcome. Today, being the 1st of August, 2021, uh, in South Africa, the month of August is designated uh, Women's Month. Uh, this is a month where, um, you know, we celebrate the women of our country. Uh, we celebrate, you know, the people uh, who have done great things as women uh, in their various professions or career choices. Um, you know, um, for them to achieve whatever level that uh, they've achieved, we know that they've had to go through a lot of hurdles, you know, uh, some of those could be racial, some of those could be as a result of patriarchy, and many other issues like, you know, the pull him or pull her down kind of syndromes that is quite prevalent out there. So when we showcase somebody who has done well in their chosen profession, especially a person who's a woman, um, it takes so much more for them to get to where they are because of the challenges that they've had to face. So um, as a result of that, uh, we dedicate the month of August as a month where we need to then celebrate some of those women. We know there's many of those people in South Africa, but we can only you know, uh, profile a certain number of people. But to kickstart that uh, you know, uh, series, which we have uh, named uh, The Future is Female. Uh, so our first guest today is Dr. Yondela Nema. All right, Dr. Yondela Nema. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she's got a very long CV or bio, but I think it is important for me to take you through that so that you can know why we have chosen uh, to have her today um, as our guest. She is, um, just hold on, yeah. She's an admitted advocate who is currently in possession of a BPROC, uh, undergraduate degree, an LLB, uh, LLM, and also a PhD, all right? Um, and she's very passionate about law, ethics, compliance, and governance. She's currently the group executive for ethics and compliance at Palo World. And prior to that, she was a vice president spearheading group compliance uh, and ethics, governance and assurance for SASOL. She also um, is a vice chairperson and a ministerial appointee uh, at the University Council of the University of Johannesburg. She has built her reputation as a compliance and ethics expert and is frequently invited as a speaker and a panel member at compliance and ethics conferences in South Africa. She's also a member of the International Women's Forum. Over the past 15 years, Ms. Nema has also had various positions at South African Revenue Services, Investec Asset, Manage uh, Asset Management, APSA Asset Management, Alexander Forbes Investments and the JD Group. In addition, in 2018, she was seconded as a visiting attorney at Sherman and Sterling's litigation practice in Washington, DC and in New York before she proceeded to Boston to complete her general management program at Harvard Business School. So um, you can see that uh, this is a person who definitely you know, deserves, uh, you know, for people to know about and be inspired by her profile. She also holds seven postgraduate certificates in money laundering from RAU, Advanced Corporate Law and Securities, UNISA, Compliance Management, UCT, Legal Writing, University of Vetbatasran, International Leadership Development Program from Gibbs, Supply Chain Management from Smil College of Business, Penislavia, uh, Penis oh, that, that one always gives me a, a trouble. Um, Pen Pennsylvania 
right? And leading women uh, at Gordon's Institute of Business Science. Yeah, um, Yonela, welcome to the Dr. Fundi channel. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> and I'm glad I could make it. Yeah, man, you know, um, just before we start our interview, I need to share with our, you know, our viewers that we've been working on this interview since last year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we were supposed to have it on a certain Saturday last year. Mm. Um, and then the day before, you know, um, you, uh, you fell ill. Yeah. And uh, you could not, uh, you know, honor the interview. You know, you told me obviously upfront that, you know, um, it's going to be impossible. Mm. And so we waited for a year to yeah. have this interview. But uh, I guess, you know, there's always a reason why things happen. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's all good. We eventually have uh, the interview today. So, yeah, um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I just want you to relax. I want <laughs> you to relax. You know, today there were so many issues that also threatened today's interview. Your flight, uh, yeah. getting delayed from East London, uh, and us having to move the times and everything. But yeah, I'm just happy that uh, you are here. All right, let's start our interview. Okay. So um, you're here because of all the achievements that you know I've just read in your bio. Um, you know, and the intention is to celebrate you. Oh, and the yeah. intention is to also make sure that as we celebrate you, we mm. inspire others, you mm. know, we motivate others, we demonstrate to others that, you know, it is possible, despite whatever challenges that could be there, you know, mm. in whatever career that you've chosen. But mm. it is important that people know that if you continue, they are consistent, you do what you have to do, you know, you will succeed. You know, so yeah, yeah. Um, but before we get to, you know, your achievements, I just want you to share with us, who is your Nella? You know, oh. just in, 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 in just one or two sentences, who is your Nella? I know you are a professional, yeah. and you're executive, you are highly learned, but just the person, who is your Nella? Hmm, okay. Uh... I'm from the Eastern Cape, uh, and Indela is a woman who is ambitious, driven, and um, family orientated. I come from a very solid family, and uh, I'm passionate about uh, matters of uh, ethics, compliance, and I think, as a side, I'm also uh, passionate about giving back to the community. Uh, in terms of imparting uh, any knowledge that I've learned uh, yeah. via mentoring, yeah. All right, all right. Okay, I think uh, I need to be specific. You come from the Eastern Cape, from mm -hmm. a very tight family that I know very well, very mm -hmm. tight family, but um, how many siblings do you have? Are you the last born? Are you the middle child? Because I know there's a bigger brother than you, so you can't be a first born. So yeah. You yeah, what kind of family do you come from? And, uh, you know, what position do you hold, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, that kind of family? Oh, okay. So I have uh, three siblings. Uh, my brother, his name is Mande. He's the eldest at home. So I'm the second born. And then after me comes uh, my sister, Amanda. And then the last born at home uh, is Sander. So we're left with uh, our mom, uh, said the... Uh, uh, our father or dad passed away yes. so that that's me in terms of the family background yeah, yeah. all right so uh, there's basically four of you at home as siblings yeah. Yeah. with Monday being uh, the older brother and you yeah. are the second born so you and Amanda are basically middle children yes. now yeah. middle children they tend to take a certain personality they tend to be go-getters uh, mm -hmm. They tend to be people, you know, who don't wait for things to happen. Uh, they don't have a special place in their family yeah. as a firstborn or mm -hmm. the lastborn. Now, mm -hmm. how would you describe yourself? You know, are you a typical middle child? Yeah, I am. I am. Uh, I've had to fend for myself from a very early age. 
uh, and I, I, I'm grateful actually for that background because I don't think I'd be where I am if I was cushioned or if I had received special treatment. So, um, I mean, I started school early. Uh, I, I think my parents didn't intend for me to start formal schooling at that age. It's that there was no helper to assist in terms of taking care of me. So I started formal schooling at four. So I've had to not just fend for myself, but to grow up too quickly. And I think that sort of also plays out in me uh, as a mother. Like I, 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 I don't wait for a plan B. I don't have a plan B. Uh, I have to make things happen myself or else things won't happen. Mm. So I think that's what has, um, it, it, that's what being a middle child uh, has helped me. Yeah. All yeah. right. And, and, and having a big brother, you know, mm. you always had somebody to run to when yeah. uh, you know, other kids are teasing you out there. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. so what role, uh, you know, has he played, uh, you know, in you growing up, you know, protecting? Mm. Yeah, very protective. And uh, I'm actually grateful for my brother holding the family together, especially after uh, Uta okay. passed away. He had to step up and not just be a brother, but to be a, a deputy parent uh, yes. over and us having, uh, being left with my mother. So yes. he's all that we have for direction, guidance, support, uh, is the only brother and is the only son in the family. Yeah. So, and so what about you now as the big sister to Amanda and Sisanda? Uh, I do play my part. We work uh, coherently together. So I think that's why we are very close as siblings. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you ever notice in my posts, I always say greetings to my siblings. Those are the siblings that I refer to because those are my sanity, my support structure, uh, we, I, I never feel alone in whatever I go through, whether it's at work or personally. Uh, so, and vice versa, we're there for each other. So, yeah, yeah, yeah my, my, my siblings are uh, my All everything. Right. Yeah. But I get a sense, though, that um, as a family, you know, especially when mom and dad were still around, you know, mm. what kind of values would you say? You know they've instilled in you now both your mom and dad mm. those that are, that are still you know channeling you guiding you mm. as you are navigating your professional and and and, and life in general yeah uh, that's an interesting one so the values that they've imparted to us uh, first and foremost or the most important one is to be god fearing uh, and you know that sort of has in turn inculcated uh, a value of staying humble, staying grounded, uh, and, and also respect for people, uh, which especially for me in, in, in the line of profession uh, that I'm at, it's something I don't think I would have excelled uh, if I, it, that was lacking because I'm sure you, you've noted in most company values, respect mm -hmm. is one of them. And then integrity, you know, um, and then as siblings, one of the values uh, that they inculcated was, you know what, there'll be a, a family rivalry or sibling rivalry. All you have is each other. Uh, yeah. and my father used to say, uh, if something happens or if one dies, you guys are going to bury each other. So that sort of uh, yeah. kept us close, irrespective of what uh, we would go through because we had no other like extended family to rely on for things to happen. I, I we have to pull together. It is that inner cycle? Uh, or, yeah, or, yeah. So that is also played out in terms of how we bring our kids as, as siblings. We we are there for each other. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, of that trust. So um, in support structure. Yeah. All right. So between mom and dad you know, who would you say you were closest to growing up? Obviously, they're both that. your parents. They're both your parents. You love both of them. Um, but uh, there tends to be one that you're more close to than the other. Uh, and so that's why I'm asking. And, and the, the reason why I'm asking is because, you know, in your posts, you know, um, one sort of gets a, a sense that you were daddy's girl. Yeah. So to answer your question, Doc, I was uh, very close to my father. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and again, I think in terms of your earlier question about values, uh, he also inculcated the value that as a woman, uh, I, I must, I, I, I deserve to, to, to have my voice heard. You know, so he, I think, was a feminist at heart because uh, he married uh, my mother young uh, when he was when she was just completing uh, high school, but nevertheless allowed my mother to go to varsity. So that's the value that played out throughout our lives. We he never uh, groomed us to sit and wait for things to happen for fireworks. Mm. He, he inculcated the value that you must believe that you can do it. Yeah. So, so that has gone a, a long way, and especially as a woman, uh, 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 doc, because uh, in terms of self confidence, self esteem, and unconditional love, so mm-hmm. you can pick up a toxic environment, whether it's personal or work, because you you you've, you've been taught that value that you matter, you, yeah. you are special. So any treatment that is contrary to that, I mean, you can quickly identify that. Mm, this doesn't add up. Yeah. All right. So um, at the time you were growing up, still young, I mean, you started schooling at four. Um, so in your early days at uh, junior school, what did you want to be? <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, uh, because I sort of, um, my father was my hero. All that I ever wanted to be was to walk in his footsteps because he also was in the legal field, it, that sort of influenced my choice of career. So there was no confusion in terms of, I have three options. I, I've always been clear that I, I wanted to pursue the, 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 the legal field, yeah. Yeah, and so my name is a lawyer. You are a lawyer as well. And uh, the other two? So uh, the other two sisters are entrepreneurs. So. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, they've taken the lo- road less traveled and, and yeah. they're the biggest in the family. <laughs> the, the, so, risky, yeah. the, the risky road towards wealth, yeah. uh, you know, for, uh, you know, towards the uh, uh, wealth development or accumulation. All right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you wanted to be a lawyer from early, early age. Uh, mm. Let's move on to secondary education. Um, mm. Any highlights there? And uh, at what point? You know, uh, did you get to crystallize or you were never confused uh, about the legal, you know, uh, profession mm. that you mm. wanted to follow that? You, were, you know, in my case, for example, I knew I wanted to be a doctor from age four. But when mm. I was, uh, you know, grade, what they call standard nine, you know, mm. and I started mm. teaching engineering, pharmacy and things like mm. that. So in your case... Did you ever entertain any other profession but law? No. Uh, when I went to high school, uh, the teacher uh, decided for me that I, I, I was not that sharp in maths. So that sort of took away that choice or option in terms of other careers I could have pursued. So it, it then you know, we defaulted, I defaulted to square one that, I mean, the only thing I could become was either a teacher or a social worker or, uh, you know, uh, pursue a legal career and it was then uh, law again. Yeah. All right. But, yeah. Okay. So any other highlights where you, you're like a sporty kind of kid, you know, in secondary uh, or into drama and or, or debating or things like that? No, 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 not in high school. Uh, I think I was a bit matured, immature, because I mean, I matriculated at 15. So yes. I, I don't think I was that mature to think I had in terms of, I, I was not active in sports. There was nothing much that was offered uh, from a sports point of view. Uh, I mean, I focused on the books. Um, most of my life growing up was always about um, studying, 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 being a bookworm. So that's why I mean later, I then decided, you know what, I, I focused, taking life seriously. Now I have to live for myself and live a little. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. What was that? The high school year? Uh, Holy Cross. P. I'm tired. I'm tired. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Holy Cross is one that was started by Sister Lane. 
was it not a Roman Catholic yes. school? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, uh, not far from the public swimming pool, Yes, yes, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. all right. I associate you with East London. I don't associate you with, with Umtata. Oh, really? No, yeah. I, I never went to school in East London. We, we just moved to East London, I think, probably after democracy. But all my life, uh, I was in Umtad. <laughs> oh, OK. All right. OK, so you did your matric. And then how did you do? You know, uh, you were not doing maths. Um, you know, that uh, the teacher told you good. Ah, ah, ingati akso golisa le. So, but uh, what was the Well, you know why I'm asking you this question? Uh, because sometimes uh, people then look at a Yondela uh, who has a PhD, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who has had all of these things. And bangas, mm -hmm. uh, at some point, uke wa kwalela, you know, u uh, Yondela, like, like the, the issue you met, you know, yet uh, mm -hmm. it's not about how one starts, you know, mm. uh, in, 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 you know, as, as you are developing your career. So I just want to know, Jigba, what uh, mm. I'm a good Alan Kualela in my life. Uh, so a high school, I, I mean, I, 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 I got a C and I, I think, um, you know, in terms of your question, you are making me think of something now that you know being moved to e history biblical studies stream mm. he had an ability of um because we don't talk about these things it had an it, ability it, it, of killing killing self esteem self esteem yes because whenever there was a career guidance there'd be someone who was a focus on math physics stream even whenever there were sponsorships or e scholarships or bursaries like he, he, you were on your own if you were not quick, 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 quick medical, medicine. you know, medicine science or engineering and everything. No one would come and hold our hands because Tina you know, it, it beeps and uh, he's not as not future. Yeah, one. So you you then have to get to a point of being so uh, comfortable in your own skin and believe in you know, you will become something one day, even if I go with a stream. Uh, 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 you know, I, I guess that's why later I then started pushing myself because I was conscious of the fact that, it, like, I mean, as you know, even so many university already yeah. before you graduate, uh, if we stream, say, 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 say medicine, yeah. everyone is banking and banking on you, you know, in Dubai, yeah, you make it big when uh, what he's through so well, like, through and through. So, mm. so yeah, I mean, it's not like I, I was an A student. I mean, I'm a mm. hard worker. I was a hard worker. Uh, mm. I mean, definitely perhaps not the sharpest um, crown, but definitely one of the brightest crowns in the box. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, you passed your matric with the C, uh, which was good. Um, and then can go to the university. And so yeah. where did you go to do to, to, to your, your, your PROC? Uh, Natal, University of Natal, Howard mm. College in Devon. So mm. that's where I did my BPROC and my LLB. The LLB, yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, yeah. so, so, but now, you know, in law in Natal, they, at those days, when it was still just University of Natal, before mm -hmm. the UK is at end, um, there was Peter Marisbeck. Yes. And there was also Howard College. Yes. So, did you have to choose Marisbeck or Ganya Howard or Howard College, or it was straight, you know, Howard College for you? Oh, that's an interesting one. So, at the time, Ipiproc uh, was only offered a Howard College campus. Okay. A Marisbeck campus they offered uh, EPA law. So yeah. it was a three-year degree, which was a BA law, and then Howard College it was uh, like your uh, Biproc, your full law degree, which was four yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was the time where you could do an undergrad and then you add a year or two, or was it two years of LLB? Yes, yes. Yeah. So LLB at the time was honors. Yes. So irrespective of whether you did social science or BA or BPROC, the next level would be honors, which would yeah. uh, be LLB. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that means you spent something like six years at, 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 at uh, University of Natal. Uh, it was supposed to be six, but I, I got a dean's recommendation to do my LLB over a year. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's that's sharp crayon. Yes, Bonisa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's why I finished my yeah, instead of six, it it it, it was five. Yeah. Yeah. And so what did it, what did it mean to you though when you got that uh, dean's recommendation, uh, which effectively shortened your number yeah. of years of study? Yeah. Um. It was obviously a big deal. Remember, the, 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 I'm asking yeah. this question in the context of what happened when you were told Ngena was a stream. Yes, yes. You, you felt to buy a new way, and then you know, so now there you were, you've chosen yes. a direction and yes. you are now starting to excel blood direction. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, so when I was doing LLB, they introduced e electives, the commercial transactions, yeah. uh, because you know traditionally e law would be just law, and it would be a shortcoming at times if you want to join a corporate, because I mean it's like strictly law. So that year they introduced the tax law uh, mm -hmm. as an elective. So the year LLB, that's the elective I chose. So yes. it was an exciting moment for me because. I then at the time learned that EUCT was offering e-masters in tax law. Yeah. So, uh, and because I, I wanted to branch a bit into commercial law and not mm. do like law, 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 law. You know, mm. I, I wanted to specialize and mm. do something exotic uh, that will make me money. I didn't want to be a traditional lawyer, um, criminal law lawyer, for example. Yeah. I was mm. not interested in being a criminal oh, human lawyer. rights lawyer. Human rights is something that is close to my heart. That's interesting uh, that you, you talk about human you rights. Know, well, those days, in the 80s, Tina uh, gave a lot You know, it uh, was as means, it was like criminal law. Okay, yes, we are going to say human rights because, you know, anti apartheid and whatever. Yes. Uh, you had to have somebody saying, if you know, we are convincing, or if you are notary, or you know, tax law, or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I, I think it became a stepping stone uh, for me then, I mean, to answer your question, because, I mean, it was not just in terms of I've got LLB, but there was a, a like commercial law undertone uh, yeah. in terms of uh, the qualification, which, mm -hmm. I mean, after I learned, I could further my studies in that field. I did. Hence, hence my first um, uh, job was with SARS. Yes. So you went and did your LLM at UCT? Mm -hmm. All right. And how was that? You know, the move from uh, Deben to, um, you know, Cape Town, uh, change of universities. And um, you were still young. I mean, even at that time, yeah. was, this is like uh, about age 20 now. Or yeah. 21. Yeah. So I, yeah. So when I completed my honors, I was 20 and then I went to do uh E, e, e masters, e, 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 like the transition was, was tough because EUCT was more. Let me think of a word that's about politically correct. So it was not a, a transformed university. It was yeah. a, a white university, and and I really struggled. Um, I, I don't want to lie to you. I, I really struggled, but. Uh, in a way that sort of toughened me up because mm. I think I also felt I had a point to prove, you know, but I could graduate from UCT, you know, yeah. and I won't be expelled and I won't drop out uh, as tough as it was. So that transition was tough. And mm. the what this is then, I mean, ERES was full, I guess, because it was post-grad and mm. that was my first time ever uh, in Cape Town. So I had to commute uh, to, 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 to varsity. Um, so, but I mean, I, I soldiered on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, um, I mean, again, I mean, that was like your, 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 your two-year program. Uh, that yeah. You must, yeah. Mm. All right. So, um, there was a clear, you know, a difference in terms of the climate and the culture between, yes. I mean, in Natal uh, has always been that liberal, yes. you know, university where even but it was a bit subtle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I struggled at UCT. I, yeah. I, I didn't think I was going to make it, yeah. 
Yeah, and 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 the, the guys you were with in class must have been much older people. I mean, yeah. you were 21, 2021. Yeah, that, that was another interesting one because Koba E-Tex was new at the time. They did it late to accommodate part-time people. So yeah. the only difference was if if you were doing masters, then there was a thesis uh, yeah. that we attended with post-grad diploma in tax. People were mainly professionals, either tax consultants or tax lawyers and so on and so on. So yeah. it, it, it was tough from that point of view as well, in the sense that it was not a typical class with people of your age group. I mean, I was now attending uh, with people who were studying part-time, yeah. even though yeah. I was full-time. Mm. Okay, yeah. all right, but uh, you survived the two years and uh, you got your master's degree. Um, mm -hmm. What topic did you do, I mean, with, with all masters, there tends to be e research. So, what was the topic that you chose? Uh, it was the use of uh, trust as uh, a vehicle for tax avoidance. Mm. Yeah. All right, and we uh, research, did you come up with something that? Uh, <laughs> That was eventually adopted by SARS, seeing that you went and worked at SARS soon thereafter. Ah, that's an interesting one. I don't even know if they adopted anything. To me, it was like a thesis, then I graduated, and SARS was sort of a natural progression or yeah. ideal place for me uh, to work at, having done tax. Mm. So, so, yeah. What was attractive about SARS to you? Uh, besides the fact that yes, I mean you were an expert in 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 in, SARS and in tax matters, um, was there anything else that attracted you about SARS? Because at the time, I think you know when people looked at different agencies of government, mm -hmm. SARS was one of those agencies or institutions of government that was highly rated. You know, yeah. uh, you know, in, in terms of performance, uh, yes. and the other one being um, another entity was uh, AXA. Airports Company mm. of South Africa was also, you know, mm. seen as that organization that if you join, it's, it operates almost like a private sector. So, yeah. So, uh, what attracted me to SARS, uh, to your point, at the time, it was renowned as the or one of the few state owned agencies uh, which were like way above your normal government entity. So, and as a result, SARS was one of my best working experience. Mm. It, it, it was a, a good learning ground, great exposure, and till today, I'm forever grateful for, for that exposure. Professionally run, uh, it, 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 was, it was quite tops, uh, I must mm. say. And also, I was fortunate enough to join SARS before they actually segregated the taxes, like, for instance, uh, customs and excise, VAT, or income tax, or um, 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 uh, what's the other one? Donations tax. You could do everything at the mm. time, which was quite nice. Uh, mm. Like in terms of there was because it was fairly early, I guess not that modernized as it is now. We, if you are a vet specialist, or if you join SARS, you can either join vet or and so on and so on, or provisional tax. So um, it, it was an ideal career uh, opportunity, which presented and being the first employer for you. So uh, yeah. where you, where, where you, you know, the one was looking at loopholes and how to close loopholes or, you know, issues like mm. you said, tax avoidance versus uh, tax evasion issues. Yeah. You know, so uh, I was uh, a legal advisor uh, responsible for the interpretation of tax laws. Uh, so for example, uh, for your business, if you needed clarity in terms of tax treatment of something, then you'd seek a ruling. So I would give a legal opinion at the time. I mean, it's something that is similar to a legal opinion. We called it a ruling. And then in terms of e, e dispute is a matters that I would go to the tax court, would then uh, uh, team up with the litigation team, which was uh, at the time based in Pretoria. So, and we'd help uh, the litigation team in terms of preparing cases to appear on behalf of the commissioner, uh, we special tax uh, court. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you moved from there, why? Mm -hmm. Uh, I was headhunted at Investec. 
Yeah. And again, there was another um, career changing opportunity for me because I remember when I went uh, for an interview, uh, investment asset management, that is, I didn't even know what a share was, what a bond was. And I, I think it becomes relevant actually now that we are in the theme of uh, your, your series uh, celebrating women in the sense that I had people who saw potential in me. Uh, I didn't know anything about financial services uh, and I, I, I was um, had handed to be a legal and compliance officer. I, I, I had never dealt with the reserve bank in my life with the regulators like your pension funds, your medical schemes, and I ended up being responsible to ensure compliance of all those uh, institutional uh, funds with all these applicable laws. So th th that's why I mean I, I grabbed the opportunity because it, it was then an opportunity for me to leave. Um, to out of your comfort zone. Yes. And, yes. and it brought you to another area of, of, yes. of growth. Yes, 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 yes. Mm. Now you're moving from an SOE, well-run mm. kind of SOE with a very a nurturing environment mm -hmm. straight into the private sector, um, mm -hmm. very Jewish environment. Mm -hmm. um, and how was that? Uh, how was that transition? I struggled. Uh, you know, I, I really struggled. I struggled uh, in the sense that the work ethic, even though uh, Sarah was quite professional, uh, it, it was very different because, uh, like for instance, things like tea time that you take for granted, tools down, now you all go have tea, you know, where there's an emphasis on that work-life balance. Yeah. It, then with corporate, it was all about work, work, work. And mm. also, I think it was the first time for me to experience how aggressive a corporate environment could be, you know, uh, where you basically are on your own, you have to, you have to fend for yourself. And given the nature of my role, because I was legal in compliance, mm. I had, to, for instance, if say there's a breach, uh, one thing I learned, uh, of which looking back, it's something that I usually emphasize when I mentor uh, young girls is, I think at times, the, some of the things that we go through are self-made. Mm. We expect someone to come to our rescue. And I've had, I've had to learn that you know what, no one is coming to save me. This thing of escalating at times, you just have to nip it in the bud and stand up for yourself and say, you know what, uh, this does not make sense or this is uh, non-compliant because if things go wrong, they will ask you, Nella, but this was in breach. And I, I can't then say, no, but I sent so and so several emails uh, reprimanding him, uh, alerting him that, you know what, what you were doing uh, was in breach. So it, it was a tough environment from, from that point of view because it was like, um, yeah, it was a tough environment, mm. yeah. So when you look at the time spent at SARS and the time spent um, at Investec, mm. now I want you to talk about two specific things here, mm. the issue of race and the issue mm. of gender. Mm. Were there any challenges uh, that you experienced that uh, were related to two? Uh, and maybe you can even bring the issue of fellow women who were mm -hmm. within the organization, were they supportive or were they supportaging? You know, I've had an interesting journey to answer that question. So SARS at the time was already transformed. Yes. So I didn't, I didn't go through uh, any form of racism. Yeah. And then uh, gender discrimination was there, but subtle. Because I was young, I, I didn't know the term sexual harassment. It's something I learned later, which actually uh, reflecting on my legal career and uh, schooling, they don't teach us at school what sexual harassment is. That's why when women go through sexual harassment, you think it's someone trying his luck. You think it's something that you're supposed to tolerate, that uh, you, you suffer in silence. You think, you know, who are you uh, to, to raise it? Uh, because the perpetrator is a very senior person. I mean, I, I've had to suffer in silence because there was no, I, I didn't know that it was prohibited conduct. Maybe mm. it was not, the organization was not vocal enough that mm. you know what, you deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. And if uh, there's any uh, sexual connotation in terms of how you're treated, report it. Mm. So, um, um, so, so that's that. 
And then, for instance, at Investec, I, I, I must say that I, I, I didn't have a female boss. Mm. Uh, and instead, I was empowered by men, mm. uh, uh, which, um, again, till today, I mean, it's people that I'm, 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 I'm still in contact with because, I mean, they were very supportive, uh, believed in my potential, which I cannot say the same in terms of later in my career where uh, the, the, the biggest enemy number one I've had to deal with, to fight with as a woman, I yes. never thought it would be other females uh, uh, bringing me down. Yes. So, All right. So, 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 yeah. so um, at Investec, you sort of had sponsors then, you know, yeah. people who, who look men. after, you, you know, yes. who are men and they yes. ensure that, you know, you succeed. Yes, yeah, black and white for that matter. So I, I, I didn't experience any uh, uh, discrimination on grounds of race, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, ageism, you know, uh, the fact that you were a young professional and some people say I've been in this thing for the last 15 years or 20 years, you're not gonna tell me my girl, uh, mm. you know, kind of thing. Mm. Mm. Not really. Not really. Okay. Let's, really. Move on, let's move on. Let's move on. And yeah. then you, you left Investec. You went to? Absa Asset Management. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. that's moving from a Jewish environment to a very African environment. How was that transition? Uh, I was wiser. <laughs> and uh, uh, no, I was, I was wiser. And it was one of the um, uh, uh, good uh, uh, working experiences for me in the sense that uh, when I joined, I was, I think, a second or third uh, female to join the company. And uh, also, <laughs> there was no structure. It was a new company. So yes. I was trying to the end. It was a nice learning opportunity where I had to set up yes. everything uh, uh, myself. So I, I, I got to use the experience I had gathered in terms of putting together templates, agreements. So it, it was a, 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 a great uh, career growth for me. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and a supportive environment was, if you were supportive, building yes. something, you were very reliant then on the parent company mm -hmm. to help yes. you and certain yeah. things, you yeah. leverage yeah. that which is already existing in yeah. other divisions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And uh, you stayed there for how long? Uh, for almost five years. Mm. And, and what would you say are the things that you achieved, you know, uh, during mm. that stint, uh, you know, your highlights for that five years? Uh, I had to apply for licenses uh, because we were an asset management company. I had to apply for, uh, you know, uh, employees to be key individuals, uh, in terms of then FSB. So, and also at the time, for instance, uh, when I was in the industry, uh, it was when the Uni Trust Control Act was still in place. Mm. And then came hedge funds, came collective investment schemes. So um, I then was involved in terms of, uh, you know, organizations or, you know, lobbying with the regulator in terms of influencing the direction of the legislation. So it was nice from that point of view, because yeah. it, for, for, for you to be a compliance and legal person, when you've been involved in the actual drafting, like the bill stage before it becomes the law and commenting, you know, uh, uh, liaising with the regulation, you sort of get to understand then them uh, when they call you into order that you've um, transgressed a certain section, you know fully well uh, because you've sort of walked the path uh, uh, with them. So that was a, a, a great achievement for me. Yeah. Um, in terms of setting up the desk, the agreements um, and the, the the international trade agreements, because mm. we were also doing derivatives. Um, mm. yeah. All right. So you're doing all this work. Um, obviously, you're starting to be seen as a senior person or middle to upper, you know, mm. person, you know, within mm. the organization. And then there's younger people who look mm. up to you. You mm. know. Um, so. At what point did you start to feel that, you know, I've got a responsibility to mentor and mm. coach ones, you know, who 
um, you know, a junior? Yeah, I think that responsibility came after that because at UPSA I was still, you know, uh, trying to find my feet. Yeah. And I, 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 I couldn't, um, I couldn't supersize myself and give okay. more than, yeah. So it came okay. later in life. Yeah. All right. So, what's uh, that? Alexander Forbes uh, Investments mm -hmm. in Jobek. All right. So, uh, in Jobek. So, from uh, Cape Town. From, oh, you're in Cape Town? Yeah. All right, and so uh, Forbes being a broker, but also financial services mm -hmm. type of company, mm -hmm. um, what, what are the highlights there for you? Good mm -hmm. and bad? Uh, I got an award, which was the first award uh, that I ever got in corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called the Good to Great Award uh, mm -hmm. because I introduced something that was innovative. I identified a gap. And I ran with the project successfully so. Mm. Uh, so that was a highlight for me. And also it was the first time for me to work for a multi uh, manager versus an asset manager. Mm. And also the first time where um, I, I focused on legal versus mm. uh, legal and compliance. Prior yeah. to that, I've had combined roles. Mm. And then also a, a highlight for me for the first time in my career, I was actually appointed a non-executive director uh, than chase non-executive director externally. So I was uh, a, a appointed a director of our unit trust uh, company, which gave me that exposure in terms of uh, uh, granular things like how our fees agreed upon, negotiated. And so um, th that was uh, quite an um, insightful um, exposure for me. Yeah. Um, any downside? Are there things that uh, you experienced that help you grow? Um, not really. Not really. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so must, let's move quickly uh, from Forbes, and then you went to afterwards. JD Group. Yeah. And was you? What was your responsibility there? So I joined uh, JD Group as uh, a, an executive responsible for um, group legal and compliance. So mm -hmm. it was a JC listed company at the time. This was before uh, we were bought over by Steinhoff. So yeah. in the history of the company, there was no in-house role. It was outsourced. So it was a great opportunity for me again to set up and put something in place. Uh, and, and, and again, I had sponsors that mm. till today, hmm? yes. That yes. believed in you, that supported you. Yes, yes, yes. You know, we keep on talking about this role of a sponsor because, you know, in a corporate environment, it's very critical. You yeah. know, you can be yeah. very yeah. good at what you do, yeah. but you do need to have a sponsor. Somebody yes. who even when you are not there, they yeah. will say good things about you. Yes. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, because if you don't have a sponsor, yes, you'll be frustrated. You yes. put so much energy, and uh, yes. still not be chosen for projects or promotions yeah. or things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a deal breaker, uh, Doc, to have a sponsor, uh, because for me, uh, JD Group was the place where I grew like big time in my career. It was a turning point of my mm. career. Uh, and also because I had a sponsor. So the CEO uh, at the time um, um, vouched for me, really believed in me. And then at the time there was this uh, program uh, done by the wholesale and retail CETA, yeah. we, because it was a listed retail, it was, we were in the retail sector. So we, uh, all the retail companies would nominate um, people to be part of this program. So it was done uh, in collaboration with Gibbs, but there was an international uh, leg to it, uh, which included uh, exposure uh, to markets or um, retail sector uh, in first UK, uh, US, and then Canada. I was nominated by mail uh, yeah. to participate in that program. And then uh, I was successful. And then one of the conditions 
uh, in terms of nominating a person to participate in that program because it was expensive. The, the, the onus was put on companies to then promote the people who were nominated. Mm. Ne? So, because you can't be taken through that expensive uh, uh, program, you come back holding the same role as a specialist and so on and so on. So after that program, through to their word, I was promote, promoted to uh, being a, a group exco member, you know? Mm. So that, that's where I, I, I grew and, um, yeah, it was a life-changing uh, experience, exposure for me, and I learned to find my feet. Uh, and I think on, on many fronts, as a, as a woman, as a career person, I mean, I found myself because I think prior, I sort of breezed through all these companies. Mm. If you ask me, that's why I mean, even when you ask me about these other companies, because I, I was not there, mm. but they de-elevated me there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So with all the growth that uh, you got at JD, but you still decided to move on, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, and and I also want to know at what point did you contemplate doing a PhD in Google? Oh. Um. <laughs> yeah. So I contemplated doing PhD when I was at SARS. Oh. Okay. It's an interesting story. So I had applied and was accepted at UCT because somehow uh, my mentor uh, who was a lecturer at UCT who lectured me in my master's program, somehow saw an academic in me. He sort of pushed me or saw potential as well, pushed me to do my page. So I had applied, uh, did the proposal, but it was on, uh, for example, um, talking about topics, it was the repatriation of surpluses uh, mm -hmm. from a tech point of view. But then I left SARS, so I sort of abandoned it, you know, and only picked up uh, a PhD again, new topic um, uh, when I was at APSA Asset Management. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And what triggered that? Kuba Uboma Mabuyez. I think because my mentor was on my case uh, in terms of, no, serious, it's a, it's a game changer when you have people who believe in you. Uh, mm. Because even if we, you want to rest and take it easy, they feel, you know what, there's more out there for you. You can become more. So mm. even though I had suspended those studies uh, when I was when I left SARS, because I thought the topic was irrelevant mm. uh, because I had left SARS. I mean, now I also had that nagging feeling that I need to do this thing to mm. get my toe off my back, you know, to say, okay, this is, I've, 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 I've achieved and I've done this. So, and coincidentally, my mentor became my supervisor. Chin. Hey. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, that must have been easy then, you know. Um, no. I mean, you really have a relationship with your, with, with, with your supervisor, you know, a yes. professional relationship. Exactly, uh, yeah. Someone who believes in you. Yes. Uh, but just, just, just the choice of topic, though. Because it's interesting. I mean, I saw what 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 you chose, but can you just tell us how you chose that topic? Uh, because it seems like that's what defined your career now from yeah. that point onwards. Yeah. So um, yes, it helped that uh, my mentor was my supervisor, but he was not a main supervisor, so it's not like I also had it easy. And yeah. as regards to my choice of topic, um, it, it was and personal yeah. like i had gone through i had experienced it and i had confided in my mentor that when he asked what topics start thinking of topics and he said are you sure you want to write about this i said it would be easier for me because i want to use it as a healing journey yeah and um as a tool to actually help other women out there because it's something that i've endured but not knowing that law was on my side or there was any form of recourse that was available. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What was that? What well, I mean, I know you are trying very hard to be like a politician, say a lot, but say nothing. Like, you know, what did you uh, decide to write, I mean, to, to, to research on? So my topic was on sexual harassment uh, in the workplace. And I did a comparative analysis uh, between uh, the remedies that are available in terms of South African law. Uh, I contrasted that with uh, first world or 
um, more progressive um, uh, remedies that were available in terms of Canada, near UK, near US. So mm. it was a comparative study. Mm. Um, so, and what prompted me to write about it? And I think that's why I wrote so well because it was something that was close to my heart. And even currently, I mean, I'm a volunteer, uh, by the way, on an Africa initiative uh, to end sexual harassment in the continent. Mm. So I had suffered uh, when I talk sexual harassment uh, mm. in my working career. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, and it nearly killed me, like literally, yeah. Uh, yeah. because here you are there to work, uh, to pursue your career, but over and above the stumbling blocks that are there, you have to uh, deal with sex pests in the mm. corporate. People don't talk about those things. So that's yeah. why for me, I used writing to heal, you know, because I, I again, it, when writing about it, it helped in terms of from a recommendations point of view, you know, about what is it that corporations can do better? Because mm. at times this thing does not have a name. Uh, mm. There's no awareness or not much um, awareness is done. And also from a culture point of view, you don't know if you speak up what's going to happen because in most instances, it's quid pro quo harassment whereby you are harassed by someone who's senior who abuses his organizational power, you know, because your your future, your realm, your incentives are sort of dependent. And this person now makes it conditional that if, if, if you comply, then uh, things are gonna happen for you, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a terrible tragedy that women go through in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it seems as if, so it, 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 that's why I mean, I'm quite outspoken about it because, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, it, it's, yeah. Were there, no, were there any policies? You know, I mean, most of the organizations, the big ones will tell you about quick policies but there's always a difference between Ubu Kobe policies and the actual implementation of, of policies. Um, and, um, and, and obviously, uh, these sex pests are usually male, you know, um, although it's not always just males. Um, and sometimes when you escalate that, mm. you find that uh, it is it, taken lightly. And then yeah. that policy that is there doesn't get to be implemented. Or even yeah. when you talk to HR uh, and HR, you know, and here sometimes it's females who are at HR um, and the very females, you know, will talk you out of taking action. What was your yeah, experience? So, yeah, so that, that was, uh, I've experienced it all, Doc. I've experienced mm -hmm. like you, you approach HR because it, that, that's one thing that has helped me studying law. It equips you, you know your rights. Mm. You, you know, okay, and now you've learned this is not right. You want to lodge a grievance. Mm. I, I, I once, I, the, the, the first grievance I lodged on sexual harassment, you follow the process, but the, since it's classified as misconduct, the person was not uh, disciplined. Instead, I was expected to face the same perpetrator, you know, who broke down and ended up apologizing. and. I was sort of forced to accept that apology, you know, and yet this was one of the senior, senior people uh, that I looked up to in terms of this matter being resolved. Because I even said, why raise, why create a formal avenue when if you raise a formal grievance, it's not followed through formally. formally this yes. thing might, might tear to sky. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, and because uh, I think... Uh, in terms of the, the, the laws that uh, regulate this thing, there is the informal process, but there is also the formal process, you know? So now they follow the formal process, but then by, they decide to deal with it informally. Informally, yes, yes, yes. So, 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 so much needs to be done because the e-policies are there. Because if you look at the e-code, e e which forms part of uh, the employment- the on, on sexual harassment, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, recommend that you must have a policy. So, but e policy will be what posted on the intranet, you know. Mm. Uh, so, it becomes important in terms of 
There are many issues at play when I talk. That's what I'm saying. So policy is one dimension. Tone at the top is another, you yeah. know, uh, because you, you, in the culture as well. So yeah. you, you don't want to approach uh, or report something where you know, you know, but you know what? A uh, is a one day. Yeah, well, and I've also experienced that. So that's where you sort of choose your battles that, you know what, um, let me just walk away, um, uh, you know, because it, the, the environment then becomes so hostile and toxic. Mm. Uh, because there's this person who's making your life a living hell at work. Mm. All right. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about why, 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 why experience in which of yeah. your conditions, Mazid, Huleleyo. But um, then it helps you to choose your topic and then you research your topic mm -hmm. and uh, you eventually got your PhD. Uh, mm -hmm. When you got your PhD, who saw you picking up? Alexander Forbes. Oh, uh, okay. I still remember what, the day. What did it mean for you and the family to have that red robe? Uh, for your dad, what did it yeah, mean? No. Yeah, his words were, uh, <laughs> he was very proud and I'm glad at least the entire family uh, was around uh, to attend graduation so it, it, like it's a sense of pride achievement that no one can take away from you so and at the same time as a woman as tough as the environment is you know you get to know that what you're putting on the table you, you are comfortable in your own skin I mean I uh, I don't compete with other women. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm okay, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm more for uplifting others. So, because I, I don't know. So it did that to me where I, I, I felt you know, that I've, I've achieved what I, I, I set out to achieve myself, or at least academically, yeah. and then um, get to focus on work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, just before we, we continue, um, I've mm -hmm. got my support staff lady, um, um, so if people have got any questions or comments that they would like to uh, make to Uyondela, please send them through. Uh, just comment on Facebook or comment on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to pick them up and uh, we might get one or two of those uh, being answered by Uyondela. So that no, is not I'm just... Yeah? I'm happy oh. to respond, yeah. And there's nothing yet, but uh, you know, if there are any, you know, people who are listening out there, uh, obviously there's many people who are, you know, listening via the multiple channels. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, just make a comment um, or ask a question, uh, because the intention of this session is really to share the experiences. You just see somebody who's at the top. You don't know what they've gone yeah. through, and yeah. we want to be able to say. Um, it's not always easy to get yeah. to this. Yeah. Uh, and so people, you know, if they're experiencing certain challenges, they mustn't give up uh, yeah. because it's possible to overcome some of those mm. challenges. All right. Please. So, um, but we'll pick up the questions as, as, as and when they come. All mm -hmm. right. So um, at what point then did you decide, by Doni, you are actually passionate about matters of governance, compliance, uh, and ethics, uh, because if I look at the last two jobs you've had, you know, the current job um, mm -hmm. at Palo World, you are the mm -hmm. group executive in charge of uh, compliance and ethics. And uh, mm -hmm. before then, uh, mm -hmm. at Sasol, it was basically mm -hmm. a similar kind of role. Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to know then is, when did you decide that out of everything that I've done <laughs> up to a particular point, these mm. are the two areas that I really want to make a mark. Uh, mm. that's where the Azul. Uh, it was also partly based on personal experiences where uh, people are suffering in the corporate. Mm. People are suffering. And my responsibility or part of my responsibilities is I'm the custodian of the ethics line. Mm. So, and the, it, it's something that is close to my heart because for you to thrive in this role, you, you must have other, inter, other people's interests at heart. So if you report uh, that this is what you're going through, ne? so it helps if the culture of the organization uh, is supportive of 
investigating all these malpractices or misconduct or unethical conduct. So it, it, it's something that is close to my heart. You are that voice when people are scared of speaking up. That's why even in the ethics line, there's an option to remain anonymous because fear of victimization is, 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 is real. Uh, fear of retaliation is real. Fear of people uh, uh, suffering uh, in occupational detriment because they dare speak up and come forward is real. Mm -hmm. So I learned that after I realized that there's some stuff that I went through which I was on my own, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 I want to change that for the next person, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and also for the, for, for, for the general good governance of the organization, you know, mm -hmm. because it's good that these things are addressed uh, without having uh, something disastrous or catastrophic where a regulator is the one that is now saying, hey, you've done this, but mm -hmm. you are in the, you know, it's part of your DNA that yeah. you, you yeah. take your values as a company seriously. So th th that's what prompted me to, 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 to choose uh, this line of career. All right, so now in a typical corporate, you've got the board, all right, uh, that has got non-executive directors, uh, executive directors, company mm -hmm. secretary, you know, um, and the, and then you've got the executive, the exco, you know, the, you know, where the CEO reports to the board um, and is part of the board together with the FT. Mm -hmm. Now, on matters of ethics, um, you know, there's normally a board committee, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on ethics. So just so who who is the custodian of ethics in an in in in, in, an, in an ideal type of uh, organization who's the custodian who's the person who's supposed to ensure that uh, you know the tone that is set is the right tone mm -hmm. uh, and ensure that all the necessary things for that tone to permeate is the corner and mm -hmm. also from time to time checks if things are done you know the right way mm -hmm. are the executives you know uh, talking in forked tongues you know, they say one thing when they report to the board, but actually on, you know, in terms of the day-to-day -day running of the organization, there is a subculture that actually undermines, mm -hmm. you know, the ethics. And I mean, in the last 10 years or so, we've seen a lot of companies locally and, and also beyond uh, mm -hmm. that have been caught up in serious scandals where there mm -hmm. was um, a breach you know, or failure of ethical leadership. So can you just talk to us just briefly how important it is to mm -hmm. have the right, you know, ethics at the top? Yeah, uh, it's, it's very important because uh, if there were to be a, a compliance failure, I mean, yeah. there's now uh, adverse media news, there's the reputation risk. No one wants to do business with you. Uh, you are possibly uh, blacklisted by some of the corporates. So it's that important. And then secondly, uh, whose responsibility is it? Uh, the tone must be set at the top. So that means leadership. Leadership would be uh, your group X, of course, they are operational, they are executive, but from a board uh, governance structure point of view, uh, there's a, uh, a, 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 like there are three committees, it depends, I mean, on the terms of reference of uh, the, the, the corporates. So ideally, for instance, the audit uh, committee. Social and ethics committee. Yes, ethics, yeah, ethics. And that's why I'm saying it depends on the, on, on, from company to company, because at times they consolidate these uh, committees. So there's ethics committee and then there would be your risk uh, uh, and sustainability committee and then maybe your, your audit committee. So uh, corporates must have an ability to have uh, ethic issues uh, on top of the agenda and from a reporting perspective, because that sort of helps uh, in terms of the moment they define the reporting indicators, mm. the corporate then does not do lip service uh, mm. because they in turn are held accountable by, by, by that board committee because they yeah. expect to see a report covering A, B, C, D, and E. Yeah, okay, because, all yeah. right. 
Mm. So um, from time to time, people who have the responsibility like you, you know, as executives to report on these matters mm. and also issues of compliance. Mm. Um, sometimes uh, when you take up those things, do they have to go through the CEO or you could actually report directly to the board? You know, like for example, an FD um, can actually just go and report directly mm you know, uh, on matters uh, of concern, or, mm. you know, with regards to the finances of the business. Uh, mm. They don't have to, because otherwise, if the person who is driving non-compliance on unethical mm. behavior, if this is the CEO, mm. then uh, he can block you from yeah. actually those things at a board level. So what I'm trying to ask, you mm. know, is the kind of work that you do do you report via the CEO or do you have the chance to report to the chairperson of the board or the chairperson of the subcommittee? So it's both. So uh, it goes back to the question you asked earlier on about the sponsor. So for this role to thrive, if there's no buy-in from the CEO, then that, that's it because the CEO also sets the tone in terms of that organization. So I'm fortunate and I've been fortunate enough in terms of that highest level of authority. Uh, it's important that the environment is conducive to them wanting to know what's going wrong, what's being addressed, you know? And then uh, in terms of the committees, yes, uh, if like I have to make a personal example, I personally report to the board committees. Mm. Uh, so uh, because one of the critical success factors, if you look at the global benchmarks that, I mean, um, most corporates do in terms of the compliance maturity, one of the recommendations of best practice is uh, they look at exactly what you've just asked, uh, whether this role uh, is free, independent enough uh, to be able to escalate, you have access to the highest level of authority, and as a result, the opposite is also true. I can never thrive or do my job properly if I'm told, no, 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 just show that, uh, that, that, that report under the carpet. We, we don't want to hear what you're telling us. You're telling us horror stories, you know? So then that becomes a recipe for the, the leadership not wanting to hear, address, remedy as and when things which before they become big things as and when they happen. Mm, all right. Okay. So um, what gives you a kick, though, about this? This, this thing touching about lives. compliance. What, what, what makes you... Eh? Touching lives. Yeah. Yeah, I sleep well at night knowing that I've, I've, I've touched lives because uh, you remember a, a, an aspect of my role in terms of the ethics line it's individuals, even though the component about, yeah, uh, someone has stolen company property, but mm -hmm. it's people like you and I, you know, where they've tried all avenues to, to, to speak up or to raise, it could be a, a, a grievance, it could be any malpractice, you know? So it, it, like that trust uh, in the line, I mean, it's sort of a vote of confidence because uh, you, you, you can gauge it by the number of calls that come through, that mm. people have confidence in the line. They, they, they believe you'll do something about it if yeah. they, they escalate it or bring something um, to your attention. Okay, all right. So um, that's basically what you are doing now at Barlow World uh, as a group exec. Um, your finger is on the pulse, you know, checking uh, issues mm -hmm. of ethics, and issues of compliance, and uh, you make sure that things are picked up early and reported and dealt with before they can be something that can uh, create reputational damage. Just for the benefit of people who have not done law, um, you know, or ethics, you know, there's normally this thing about, you know, people saying no, but uh, this thing is, you know, it's legal. You know, uh, but then one says, you know, the standards are different between ethical conduct and legal compliance. You know, mm -hmm. ethics tends to have a higher standard. Uh, mm -hmm. Just tell us a little bit about that. You must look part of just legal compliance and actual, you know, meeting its standards in terms of the ethics. Because something okay. could be legal, but unethical. Yeah, so... Um... I made a decision uh, when I joined my previous employer, for instance, 
uh, to, because I felt there was nothing new for me to learn legally. So illegal, uh, at times, you, you fight tooth and nail on what's to the best interest of the company. Yeah. Uh, no matter how unjust, no matter how unfair, you know, whereas the ethics is doing the right thing. You can't, if say a customer has bought something, uh, you know, and all of a sudden you're like, it has broken down. You don't give that person air time to, to, to remediate, you know? So what's the right thing to do? You know, you don't have to go to the act to say, and be so rigid uh, because you look at a bigger picture, you know, um, uh, retaining that customer, you know, but obviously within the parameters of, uh, what's legally permissible. Mm. So ethics is is more, uh, it goes beyond uh, the, the, like legal what compliance. the, yes, legal compliance. So it's all about values, you know, um, it's all about uh, what does this company stand for? Do, do we stand for this? You know, uh, I mean, for, I mean, to give you another example of something ha that happened in retail, or in one of my previous employers. So if, for instance, a car, a company car, say it ran over, uh, say a, a small child, and then uh, sadly passed away, what's the right thing to do there? Is to assist the family legally, even if there was no wrong. Uh, yeah. Lawyers, if you, you, you apply the rigid legal principles, will say no obligation, no legal obligation. Yeah. But from an ethics point of view, uh, I mean, a, a life was lost, you know, mm. what's that ch child's name, the family, uh, and then you offer to assist. I mean, it's not like it's an admission of guilt. I mean, it would have been established that there was uh, a no fault uh, on your part, but because you're a big company, you can't just walk away. So it's your soul, what drives you uh, as a company uh, to be what they call at times a responsible corporate citizen. Mm -hmm. So basically, <laughs> Your work is about the soul of an organization. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and I would guess then that you work very closely with HR because they are the ones who are supposed to help create mm -hmm. the right culture, you uh, know, uh, within organizations. Yeah, so that's just part of my job. I'm responsible mm -hmm. for many things. Yeah. So, so, so ethics, yes, it's something that is close to my heart. And then uh, I'm also compliance responsible. Compliance and governance. Yeah, so ir irregulatory compliance that I'm, or oh, it is currently uh, responsible for. Uh, it's uh, anti-bribery. I'm responsible for anti-bribery and corruption uh, program, mm. uh, which is a tall order if uh, you have uh, operations in multiple jurisdictions. Mm. So, and yet at the same time, a great exposure. I mean, uh, in the sense that, I mean, previously I've worked for a company where the, um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was the uh, dominant act that we had to comply with. So for now, um, I've had to learn and get myself up to speed with the UK Bribery Act. Mm. Yeah. So it's, 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 this is the driver. So in terms of, because it's more stricter than local laws in terms of your organized crime uh, legislation. Yeah. So that's also um, something I'm responsible for. And investigations, I'm yes. also responsible for investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which are ethics investigations and forensic uh, investigations. It's, it's a nice exposure. I mean, I... Uh, I'll be involved in dealing with something like uh, it could be theft, it could be corruption, it could be fraud. It's, it's, it's a great exposure. All yeah. right. All right. Mm -hmm. um, time is not on our side. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I wanted us to, 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 to just quickly talk about um, maybe we don't need to name the company, mm -hmm. but where the culture uh, the issues of patriarchy and maybe racism, mm -hmm. they actually really, really um, killed your spirit. Let me put it that way. Mm. The extent that you had to leave this organization. What, what mm. were you experiencing? Let's not name the, 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 the corporate, but it's one of the big corporates you've worked for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are many things. Maybe what, uh, what, what I'm more looking at, I'm not looking at the story. Mm. Maybe we can mm. talk a little about the, what happened, but 
how did you survive going to work every day where people mm. were undermining you mm. partly because of the color of your skin mm. and also because of the fact that you are a woman uh, mm. i mean how did you get the energy to wake up and go to that environment where people just you know uh, were deliberate in in undermining you and almost reducing you to just a pretty face that shouldn't say much mm. yeah uh that's a tough one i mean I've, I've i've had to survive or by making use of the support structure uh at times i mean i'd confide in my in my in my family uh my brother would tell him some of the things that I, I, i'd be going through but surviving has always been difficult because um quitting was not an option because i stood to quit without a job and uh to me i kept on having to remind myself that i i i i deserve to be here i have the right to be here this is not this person's father shop we are both employed here um um so that's what kept me going we uh, with the little faith uh, strength that you have that is left in you 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 sort of pull from it to keep going and uh but obviously some situations uh got to a point where they were so toxic uh, i had no choice but to leave the organization mm. so then it then translated to I, i must choose my battles because i don't have energy to to fight this legally you know mm. uh because it will uh it will drain me emotionally spiritually and i mean in terms of getting a reference i mean i've been threatened uh, uh for example we'll, we'll make sure you don't get uh, employed anyway you know mm. so so that thing plays with your psyche because you start thinking who am i you know uh to 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 come against this big organization or this senior person and mm. you sort of walk away you know because you know you can get it had had hurted you knowing the kind of person you are but now that you are inside they don't really mm. want you just be happy with the package and the big mm. office but don't uh, you know rattle the cage yeah dog corporate is tough we we and people go through a lot but they don't talk about these experiences so i think e support is quite important that's why i think that mentoring becomes important and preferably personally ibe a mentor that is not in the same organization as you because that person will help hold your hand and not to take rash decisions or emotional decisions mm. because it's always good to have someone who's more senior more wiser when especially you are at your lowest then that person gives you guidance yeah mm. okay all right um but you eventually left and uh, isn't that the time then that you decided you know what makendio sala e boston can then there some 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 cost there eh avat for what i don't know was it 6 weeks or 6 months i can't remember yeah so i think my decision to 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 do e have a business school i had hit the ceiling yeah there was uh, i i went back to my mentor at uc i mean i have many mentors it depends on what i need mentoring with So I had gone back to uh, my mentor at UCT and I told him I wanted to do a postdoc. He yeah. said no. Go to business school uh and then because the problem with being a specialist it, it becomes career limiting. Mm. So I, I I felt stuck in a rut. I felt I was not growing. I felt I mean like you even highlighted that my role from that company to that company uh was similar. so i wanted to be a generalist and also i found that um in in one of the roles i was given a huge budget i'm not a finance person I, i'm not good with numbers but i didn't want to have to rely on a team member to interpret the financials for me yeah. uh and also now i had a team of people to manage no one has ever taught me how to manage people you know or how to lead for that matter so because i wanted to excel so that's what uh prompted me uh to actually do that uh 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 GMP uh program yeah um, yeah all right um but how 
that time out of the toxicity of your previous organization uh, and being away um, in the US, mm. uh, so far away from your support system, mm. you know, how was that? Uh, it was tough. Yeah, it, it, it was very tough. Um, I was at crossroads in my career. I, 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 I just, and I also felt, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you invite a person to this program, you see a person as having made it, but I didn't feel like I had made it. I, I felt, um, you know, that I, I had this, I wanted more and I was not where I wanted to be. Uh, it was tough being away from home for such a long time because the second man was back to back. So mm. I was away for almost a year, you know. Mm. Uh, so the second man that started. Uh, yes. I, I New York and Washington. Yes. yes. So I stayed on. Uh, I didn't come back. So, um, but it was then not that bad when school started because at least I was now uh, with uh, a living group with people and, you know, um, started socializing whereas before i mean it was work 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 mm. in all of these bases you are talking about I mean, these are top corporates now they normally have support programs like you know employee assistance programs you know um mm. but what we tend to see is that the executives don't tend to make use of these programs mm. you know um mm. for whatever reason um so as you were going through all your issues, whether mm. we're talking about the harassment or mm. any other issues, mm. uh, did you ever use these programs? And if not, you know, why not? No, I'm unapologetic, Doc. I've had to use the program because, uh, yes, there's a stigma in terms of uh, going to see a psychologist. Mm. But because I have to be on top of my game and I can't afford to drop the ball, when I feel overwhelmed, I make use of the wellness program. Mm -hmm. And uh, even for with the previous organizations that I, I've had to work for, when I felt I was at my lowest, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it, the corporate does not need broken people. Mm -hmm. You see, that's a sad thing because you, you sort of cut yourself out of the... Yeah, so... Uh, I, I, we, we, we I, call it presentism. You present at work, but you're not really productive because there's stuff to deal with, stuff yes. that's bringing you down. You hmm. see, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, as we're about to wrap up, uh, there is a comment that has just come up uh, from a lady uh, who comes from Mtat, um, from Zenande Nandi. Dr. Ndema is career goals. It's so inspiring seeing women doing such amazing work and being in the spaces she occupies. Would she be open to mentoring? Well, um, I was gonna ask you that question anyway, in general to say, as you are going up, you mm -hmm. know, there's this concept of lift as you rise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you making yourself available to, you know, junior or younger women? Yeah. Uh, so that you can be able to impart some of your mm -hmm. wisdom that you've gained yeah. from some of the trials and tribulations that you've gone through. Yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm happy to assist. And I mean, people approach me also via Instagram uh, to assist. Uh, so I'm happy to assist. I've walked the path before. So yeah. yes, Zenanda, I'm okay. happy to assist. All right, I'm sure uh, Zenande, uh, her mm -hmm. father is a lawyer, uh, mm -hmm. is an advocate uh, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, Mr. Pilisa Nandi. So, um, so, so, yeah. So she's following on her dad's footsteps. Good. I think she sees her uh, goals in you. Uh, yeah. So, but as we are about to wrap up, um, I've been saying this. Um, mm -hmm. What message do you have for younger women in whatever profession that they have chosen? But what mm -hmm. message do you have, uh, you know, to encourage them to follow their dreams? Uh, and mm -hmm. to develop resilience and, uh, you know, stick to their chosen careers, obviously, assuming that they chose those careers based mm -hmm. on passion. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I think the, the, the first important advice I would give would be speak up. 
even when your voice is shaking, even when you think uh, what you're saying doesn't make sense. And I mean, some women say, can I ask a stupid question? Speak up, don't sell yourself short before giving others an opportunity to assess or to assist. So don't write yourself off. Mm. Uh, again, I mean, this is based on personal experiences where you sort of, uh, because you get to a point of low self-esteem, you think everyone views that, views you the same. So that's number one. And then uh, secondly uh, would be the importance of getting a mentor or a sponsor. Mm. Uh, you can never make it in life without drawing wisdom or strength or guidance uh, uh, from someone who's walked uh, the path, the journey before. Uh, yes. Because in, in yes. Ah, I like your surname. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That, that, that. Yeah. And then uh, I, I think uh, what's important, uh, again, I, I've done this, I've seen it, and I've grown from it. Thirdly, um, you know, in meetings, I feel women always have important points uh, to make, but whenever a person opens her mouth, uh, she sort of rules herself out of being heard by saying, mm, you know what, let me ask a stupid question, you know, or can I ask something? Why seek permission when other people uh, speak up? If you raise your hand, that's sufficient. D don't, don't, don't be apologetic. Don't be apologetic. Yes, yes. You know, and also I think what's important is fight for what you deserve and what you are entitled to. Corporates have got this tendency of bombarding you with responsibilities because you're a woman, you're under pressure, you want to prove yourself, you don't talk money. Don't be scared to talk about what you deserve. That goes with uh, financially as well. That you, you must know your worth. That's it, mm -hmm. actually. You must know your worth, you know, and um, uh, don't put a discount on yourself. Uh, know your worth and put a premium. Now, women tend to have multiple roles, mm -hmm. you know, um, they are mothers, they are wives, they are uncle, uh, they are aunts, they mm -hmm. are these, they are that, that balance. Mm -hmm. where now, how have you managed to, to, to create balance in your life? Have you been able to create balance in your life? Yeah, I've been able. It took me forever. Uh, people will take from you, Doc. As women, we are very nurturing, very giving. Uh, takers uh, don't get tired of taking. As a giver, know when to stop giving, uh, create boundaries. It could be your family, it could be your friends. Uh, Self-care. I learned a concept of self-care later in life. Self-preserve, self-care. You know, you can't, you, you can't stretch yourself when you are running on empty, when mm -hmm. you have nothing to give yourself, but people want to take from you, you know? Mm -hmm. So self-care is important, family or no family. If you, you, you can block a family, I've had to block, you know, because for your own sanity, you know, mm -hmm. you can't do everything to everyone. That's why it's important to choose you, your, your circle well, including friends, mm -hmm. you know, people who build you and who will uplift you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned something earlier that some women made your life hell in one of the organizations that you worked with. Before the year, the day of the day, not to leave. Mm. Uh, mm. Like what? I mean, what is that? You know, uh, we we hear about this pull her down syndrome, uh, and uh, as people are fighting patriarchy, but other people say, you know, some of the biggest uh, gatekeepers of patriarchy are women. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, will, I will give you a, 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 an example, which also, um, I mean, what I appreciate about this conversation, people don't talk about such things. And because I've healed uh, and I want other women to learn, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to share this example. So I once had this male boss, um, you know, when you get to a point where you feel it's not about work, but this person hates your guts, every move you make, uh, it, it's a problem. For example, uh, when my, 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 my father was sick and then I had to fly to East London, we had a one-on-one -on -one that was set up between myself and my boss. So I then um, uh, said I was going away 
and then uh, to East London. Do you know that she reported me for insubordination? I had to request proof that my father was actually admitted in hospital in East mm. London. And then when my father died, she then had an audacity to come to the mm. funeral. I said, okay, now you want to see whether he's six, six feet under, you know? So what I'm saying is I was subjected to that humiliation whereby, I mean, at my level at the time, I mean, I, I honestly cannot make a meeting, but now it's not about, hey, Yondela, why couldn't you make it? I'm charged with insubordination for declining a meeting because my father was on a deathbed. Mm. And that didn't end there. And I mean, countless examples, Doc, where even in one meeting, uh, it was uh, a colleague's birthday, uh, we had a team strategy session. So I wanted to uh, uh, um, uh, surprise this team member. So I quickly dashed out, I took Uber. That's where I learned you know, the power of Uber because there was an audit trail. I basically asked Uber to idle. I didn't cancel the trip to buy the cake. I came back. I was charged with insubordination. Mm. I had to then draw an Uber receipt, which I would not have been able to draw. And yet I came back with the cake. You know, I had to answer you know, uh, for, you know, I dashed out. I, I, when she was uh, talking, I, I walked out and I didn't walk out. I mean, I, 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 yeah. So it's basically pettiness. Yeah, pettiness and uh, pure gossip. I mean, countless, countless stories where I instead of being, you know, focusing on your work, you end up fighting fires because there are these people with hidden agendas. I mean, one woman even told me, um, I want a job, you know? So, and this person was my subordinate and was not even a layer lower. Mm. She was two layers lower, mm. you know? And this same lady that out of goodness of my heart, she had been retrenched, I employed, you know? Mm. Now turned against me. Now, even lots, uh, I heard from HR that she went to report me in HR that she does not like the way I address my own boss. It's not even her boss, mm. you know? You, you become assertive, you are called names, you know? Mm. So she was a bystander in a meeting, now she reports me, she doesn't like the way I am conversing with my boss. Mm. So that pettiness becomes uh, not just pettiness, it's big things because you end up having to watch over your shoulder. It's not nice to work in such an environment. Mm. Where and, and you expect that as females, you should be at least supporting each other yeah, rather than yeah. putting each other down. Yeah, yeah. No, countless examples uh, where the same female would then ask, why are things happening for you? Did you sleep with so-and-so? My own boss. Yeah. My own boss. I mean... For things to happen to me, she must make things happen. But for her to now come ask me, it, it's tough. It's it's tough, Doc, but I mean, we soldier on. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, no, um, Yodela, thank you very much, man, yeah. uh, for making time. It's been a year in the making. Um, I'm glad we've eventually had this interview yeah. today. Yeah. And it's not even an interview for me. It was more of a conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But through that conversation, I think there's a lot you know, that other people who were listening, uh, were watching, uh, mm -hmm. have learned about the fact that, you know, um, it's not easy, mm. but it's doable. It's doable, definitely. It's not easy, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. And mm. in fact, if you don't have all of those hurdles, mm. maybe you would not have developed the resilience yes. and the wisdom that you have mm. now. So yeah. how challenges that you are confronted with uh, if you deal with them successfully you actually grow as yeah. a person so yes. uh, do not run away from all the challenges or yeah. avoid them because yeah. that way you are denying yourself a chance of growing yes that's correct you know? so yeah. uh, so thank you very much man for sharing awesome. your stories about yourself but in those stories you know helping other people you know to better understand you as a mm. person mm. Uh, and to also understand that the corporate environment it's a dog it's dog type yeah. of environment yeah. and uh, if you want to make it there you have to be tough yes. you know you 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 have to develop a thick skin yes. but at the same time don't change who you are yes. you know just make people know that. I'll sell your soul. 
Exactly, exactly. Mm. So thank you very much, man. Um, okay. and, and, you know, um, I'll be doing more of these kind of stories uh, for the rest of the month uh, because there's many women here in South Africa who are doing great things and you're one of mm. those. And okay. just continue uh, mm. and keep your feet on the ground. Continue mm. being somebody who is, uh, who's got humility in success. Mm -hmm. You know, um, continue mm -hmm. doing that and just making a difference to others and to the organizations that you work for. Mm -hmm. And then God will reward you. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Thanks for having me over, Doc. Thanks. All right. No. Thank right. you to everybody else uh, who joined in. Uh, we took much longer than we normally do, yeah. but uh, sometimes to try and give a picture of somebody's life in one hour is not always <laughs> possible, especially if there are so many experiences to learn yeah. from. So mm -hmm. apologies for taking much longer than mm -hmm. we normally do, but mm -hmm. uh, we hope that uh, you've learned something from that. So thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Until uh, next time. Okay. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye.